Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, chosen of all ages, episode 147, and tonight, uh, Ben had an interesting subject there, cold weather um, cook systems, and how it's going to change a little bit over, you know, as the cold weather rolls in, and we talked a little bit uh, just before the podcast started about some of the limitations with some of the gas stoves and things like that, which we're all going to cover as we go on a little bit. But yeah, cold weather cook systems and how they change as they... Uh, as the system, or sorry, as the season gets colder. Yeah, yeah. I'm, part of the conversation earlier is I can remember talking to, uh, I'll throw, throw a little shout out to him, Jeremy uh, last year, uh, Lone Wolf, and he was complaining about his, his canister stove really struggling in the winter, and I've had the same problem. I took the family out for a boil up one day. We were just going to make hot chocolate, and it was a, a bitter cold day. It was beautiful, sunny crisp day and it, the stove just would never get enough heat to, to properly boil water. It took forever. It was such a frustrating process. And it's because those canister stoves at a lower temperature, they lose their pressure and it just doesn't pump out as many BTUs when it gets going. In fact, as they run, they actually cool down more and eventually it actually shuts itself off. Now there are things you can do to those. I mean, these are the, the go-to stoves, though, like the the fuel's relatively cheap and accessible. You can pick up a can for five, six bucks at Canadian Tire, Walmart, Cabela's, you name it. Uh, and it's super easy, especially in a nice warm summer day. Plug them in, hit lighter, boom, instant flame. Turn it off, cools down real quick. Put it in your pocket, and go away. Like they're lightweight. They're, they're relatively cheap to buy. I think you can buy the BSR titanium one I have for around 20 bucks. And in tanks are 20 bucks. I mean, probably the cheapest, lightest stove you can buy. Downside? Oh. Huh? No, I was going to say, I, I completely agree. Like, I have mine sitting over here and I've showed it before. Um, no brand name here. Don't get me wrong. This is overseas stuff, but I think I paid eight bucks for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're real cheap. They work really well, especially in the summer, but they struggle in the winter. They, they have that problem. Now, there are fuels you can buy that are higher in propane, less than, than butane, and they work at higher temp, at lower temperatures a little bit better. But the reality is they all have kind of limitations, and you threw out a number earlier, and this is not a hard and fast number. But as you approach minus 20, they all start to really show their, their limitations. Right. Um. And that's what I found anyway. And as I said, we were chatting a little bit before the, the podcast there. And I did bring out my butane stove. It's butane propane. Uh, that's kind of my go-to, as Ben said. But as it gets cold, and it doesn't really take super cold for that to start being finicky. We're talking no. like right around zero degrees. That'll stop working as good as it would uh, on a warmer day. Around minus 10, as Ben said, you struggle to keep a good uh, a good flame going with that. Where my design is, it screws onto the top of the canister. It sits on the top. Once you get it going, sometimes, as long as there's no wind, uh, whatever you're heating will reflect a little heat down, and it'll kind of keep your canister warm, and it'll help a little bit. Yeah. Still not ideal. And I uh, I said to you, what I normally do with this if it gets cold, if I know i got to use it, uh, about 10 minutes before I need to use it, I'll throw it inside my coat, which, once again, still not ideal, because now you're taking that cold metal object, throwing it inside your coat with you, which... I mean, we've all done it. We get away with it, but it's really not a good idea, especially if you're way out in the woods. Yeah. And, and there are a few methods. I think we may have even mentioned them before. Um, if you sort of submerge that can canister in water. So if you find running water, you find water, that water is going to be zero or above. Anything below that it would freeze. So if the temperature inside is minus 12 and you put it in water, you've already increased it by 17 degrees. <clears throat> which is a great help. It'll work. And if you can have slightly heated water and throw into it, that's going to work even better. But like problem with that is now you got like a bowl or a pan with your stove in and in water and then your, another pan on top of it. It starts to get to be a complex system um, and not necessarily ideal. Um, and like depending said, on what like, you're using, um, not to cut you off there, Ben, these have a like a, a hollow in them. 
So if you get them in there and you trap an air bubble in there, if it's something light or you take the pot off and you didn't notice it, now the whole thing upheaves and tips over because of the air that's in it when it's floating watered. And it really does turn into a, a nightmare really fast. Yeah. Um, so there's there are methods to deal with it. I'm not saying one is better or perfect, but you can deal with it. And like you said, if you got a decent heat shield and a pot, that area will heat up and stuff. And I mean, that's an opposite problem in the summer because I've seen that too where you've you can overheat one of those canisters and they get like really high pressure and then you have all kinds of other problems. And that really becomes a bit of a very visible in alcohol stoves, mm. which is maybe something we can move on to. Like we've talked with canisters. Now let's move to alcohol. Uh, also a cheap option for a stove. We've made them here on the show. Um, but they are temperature dependent. Under they're cold, they're, they're a little bit finicky to get started. And if they get hot, they burn themselves out real quick. Um, they overpressurize. And Watch I mean, myself, it. I'm not super great with them, but I know our winters, uh, you get some really cold days. I've been, I've struggled to actually get them going and stay going. Like the alcohol will ignite, but they never start self vaporizing. You know what I mean? They just kind of snuff themselves out or you never really get a, a warm flame out of them. Yeah. So a few tricks I've found, and if you um, you find the more the professionally made ones, some of them actually have legs so they can sort of suspend themselves off of a surface. Uh, and that kind of helps if you can keep them off, and then it's just the air cooling them in. Because when you put them on a cold surface, that keeps that alcohol a liquid, and then it doesn't burn. It needs to heat up enough. You basically create trying to get that thing to light. You prime it by lighting a fire on top of it, and that causes the fuel inside to boil and get this gas and that gas is what burns so it's a great system um the problem being of course if it gets cold if there's something sucking that heat out of it you you lose that flame and it just goes out and it's it's a problem with them. uh really fun to play with also like i said relatively cheap and inexpensive but not necessarily the uh the perfect year-round stove it has its 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 limitations uh beauty is literally uh all but weightless uh potentially and uh no real space i mean they don't take up a lot of room but again cold weather has its limitations and that's when sometimes that that quick warm meal is or a warm cup of coffee is probably the most important mm. is when you're in the winter and you're cold and you just want to warm up so what I'm looking for, and this is what I'm looking for myself right now, this is, is the perfect system. What is the system that's going to get you that cup of co uh, hot chocolate, tea, coffee, whatever, in the least amount of time in the winter? So when you're going in, you want to be able to set it up pretty quickly and get it going. What is the solution? And that's a question we're throwing out to you folks, too, our listeners. If you have an ideal system in your mind that uh, maybe we haven't seen it, we haven't tried it, because, uh, you know, we don't say we know everything, have seen everything, done everything. Trust us, we haven't. Uh, we learn just as much as you folks do, too. If you have a system out there that you think is the perfect system or something that we should take a look at, uh, let us know. Once again, you can contact us on our webpage, Facebook, anywhere there, social media, uh, and give us your thoughts. Now, from the comments, and this may be the next logical step there, Ben, um, twig stoves, multi-fuel stoves, or open fires, all of which we chatted about, too, before the podcast. Yeah. Um, and not bad systems, don't get us wrong. We understand if you're out in cold weather and things like that, generally you're going to have a fire going to keep yourself warm, and if you have a fire going, you're going to cook on it, uh, which is all good and dandy. However... Those things still have a little bit of limitations, too, based on the weather and cold and things like that. Uh, mainly being, if it's cold and snowy, sometimes you really struggle with getting dry materials to get a fire going. Uh, which, once again, if you're going out camping, stuff like that, I'm sure you'll put the effort in and all is good. But for the instance of a quick hot drink... Uh, or to get a fire going in a twig stove or something like that. It, it's sometimes more, I'm not going to say more effort than it's worth, but it, it's a lot of effort that you got to put in to make your tinder, get it small enough, get your fire going, find that dry wood because it's either buried in snow or slush or ice or whatever the case may be, uh, and then render that fuel down small enough to burn in your twig stove. Like There's a lot going on there. Not saying it's a bad option, just saying there is a lot going on with that. 
So we both have twig stoves. We both have experimented quite a bit with twig stoves. I mean, again, relatively cheap option. Uh, so I like it. Um, and it, I mean, you don't have to carry any fuel. Fuel is out there. The issue I kind of have with this is and it's not all encompassing is our winters here are generally cold, wet winters, not cold, dry weathers and winters. So if they were cold and dry, I would say not a big problem. You could almost always find good firework. But here, as most people that are in, say, Nova Scotia area would be able to tell you, is we pretty well go from freeze to melt to freeze to melt. And our winter's wood is hard to find good dry wood. I'm not saying I can't get a fire. I can pretty well always get a fire going. But it sometimes is a more of a struggle than you'd want. Um, and in a lot of spots, you can't have an open fire. So you'd have to be using your twig stove or a bowl method, which works quite well. Uh, and it's not something I'm against, uh, and I have the system, but it doesn't quite reach the the quick criteria I want. I want something I can set up, do my boil, leave basically no trace, and, and do it quick and clean. So, good option, works year round, doesn't re isn't really overly affected by cold weather. Once you get wood burning, it it's pretty well self sustaining. Um, does take a little bit more effort. That takes away the quickness. Especially in wet, you know, you're, you're looking for branches off of trees, lower dead branches that are usually still pretty dry, uh, and get your stove going. Uh, a good compact um, makeup cleaner with a, a little bit of wax in and put one of those in. You can usually get a, a wood, one of these little uh, stoves burning uh, even with wet wood. So uh, that's definitely a great method. And that's my little sort of hint. If you want to take anything from this show, uh, those wax fire starters in one of those wood burning stoves will pretty well get soaked wood burning if you've processed it well. And something uh, from the comments here, and I've done this myself and I've heard other people say it. So if you don't know it, uh, great, another great little tip. And if you do know it, I'm sure you've tried it, you know, department of redundancy department. Anyway, uh, <laughs> bag of wood pellets in the backpack for your gas oh, firing yeah. stoves, your twig stoves or stuff like that. And that's not a bad idea at all. Uh, wood pellets work great, especially in, um, have you seen the the gasifying rocket stoves? The, they're kind of like a fold-open rocket stove uh, and gasifying stove hybrid. Uh, I'll see if I can find a picture to one and throw in the description later, but they work really well in that because uh, they get going incredibly hot really fast. But once again, you're still carrying that extra bulk. Uh, sorry, let me backpedal. Still... A great idea. I've done it, and I recommend it for people to do it if you have the option available to you. But you do have that additional bulk of taking the fuel with you. Uh, so now you have to keep the wood pellets uh, with you, depending on how many fires you want to have, how long you want to sustain that. It's going to dictate how much you have to carry with you, which adds weight, it adds bulk. Uh, maybe great for the day trip. If you have the extra room and stuff, you're not having to worry about a sleep system and things like that. Uh, if you're going out for a few days, maybe it becomes a problem. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you just use the pellets to get it going. But you still have that little bit with it. Um, and something that Steve said here, and maybe you know a little bit more about it. Uh, he heard the answer in cold weather is white gas. Doesn't have one. Don't much know much about them. What's your thoughts, Ben? Do you know or have any experience with white gas stoves? I do. Uh, and it is one of the subjects we're going to get to uh, shortly. Um, because one of the things I want to talk about is a multi-fuel stove. Uh, and I have a couple of examples sent to you. Uh, and they will burn white gas, actual gas, oils, uh, kerosene, diesel, things like that. Um, yeah, this is an example of one here. Um, I, I think I've sent you two. Another one kind of looks like an old Coleman lantern. Yes, there. Uh, so these are two methods and a lot of these will burn multiple fuels and, and white gas is a great thing. And it, the thing with these, the trick with these that I have experienced is to get the gas to burn, you have to turn it or the fuel to burn. You have to turn it into a gas. It's, it's in a liquid form. And that's what the little pipe that runs over the burner is for. So when you first light them up, they have a little bit of liquid gas that comes out and you light that liquid gas off. And that creates a little ball of fire, usually in a little cup or whatever there. Heats everything up and then they'll start going. So it takes a few seconds to get them going. Uh, but if you look at the specs for a lot of these things, they are 
actually very impressive. So basically for say 600 mil, you can get like two hours burn time um, on some of these stoves. Uh, and you can burn like 25 to 50 liters of, of water with one. So one tank will pretty well do you a good trip um, and provide you with a lot of cooking time. Um, there is some prep time to it. You have to usually pressurize them. So it's a hand pump it up, get it lit, a few minutes to get it going. And sometimes they say like the initial burn can be quite sooty, quite dirty. But then once it gets going, it's usually a pretty clean burn. Uh, does take some practice. And that's the thing I think people need to understand is don't grab one of these and run out in the woods and think, okay, I'm going to be perfectly great because you could very well burn, burn something down with it. Um, if you read some of the descriptions of people, their experience with them, you'll see like ball of fire, uh, damn near burn myself trying to set it up. <laughs> Um, things along these lines, like they, they have a, a dangerous aspects to them. White gas, if you've ever worked with it, I'm sure you've worked a bit with it, Rock, is bit. extremely flammable, like scary flammable, just like gasoline. Like it, it lights off with virtually little to no encouragement. Uh, any heat and any spark will pretty well put it in a position that it'll ignite up. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it is actually the method that I'm most looking into right now. Uh, but there is one I kind of wanted to bring up before we go too much more into that. I wanted to bring up solid fuel stoves, uh, not mm. like wood, but like the little isbit stoves. And I sent you a link a couple of seconds ago. I don't know. Uh, yep. And I was in Cabela's the other week, and they have another one. That they compared it to Esbit, but they're supposed to be even better. They, they light up quicker and faster and all that. But these solid fuel stoves are, are definitely a pretty good option. And this thing here, this little box, folds up, fits in your pocket. I've seen people use them. It's at 25 bucks, and I think one or two of those tablets will pretty well bring your, your 500 mils or something to a boil, no trouble. Uh, the military used to issue us similar things when I was in there. Uh, it is quite a good little system. Um, really hard to dial in uh, for like, you can't simmer with it per se. You know what mm. I mean? Like it's, you're getting one heat and one heat only. Uh, but it's definitely a step up and not a, not a huge difference than trying to do it with a candle. Uh, a couple of tea lights will boil water eventually. Uh, you just wouldn't try to boil a large amount of it. This is, is hotter than that. Uh, and a, obviously a decent option and you can add a couple more to get more heat or just use one or break it down. You just want to, uh, to try and burn less, uh, just if you just want the warm water or something. Mm -hmm. No, definitely a method I wanted to get out there before we got too far into this. So those are kind of the methods that we wanted to talk about most open fire, like fire from wood, uh, can't always have a full fire campfire anywhere. Uh, the, the twig stoves you can use in a lot of spots, but we've talked with them before. Depending on who you talk to, sometimes uh, game wardens, uh, landowners, parks may be a little less uh, excited to see you use those. Mm. It, it sometimes comes down to the discretion of the person that's yeah. inquiring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, not, they're not a bad method. None of these things that we've talked about or mentioned are no. bad methods. They all work in their own right, uh, and they all work good in their own right. We're, I think the idea is we're just looking for what is the best option out there. Um, and from the comments there, it looks like Sean has one uh, for that purpose, but rarely uses it. Um, the Isbeth or the multi The multi-fuel. Multi Oh, yeah. So, I'm kind of with you. I think the multi-fuel is probably the way to go. I also think you probably have to sink a few dollars into it. I don't think there's going to be an ultra-cheap option for a good multi-fuel stove. Because I think you are going to get a little bit of your money's worth, you know what I mean? Like, you'll get what you pay for to a degree with this uh, type of setup. Because there is... There's almost a carburetor system in these multi-fuel stoves uh, that self-regulates the fuel as it goes in because of the different fuels and things like that. And I just, I don't know how comfortable I feel with that being lower quality. Yeah. 
Um, I had the same issue. Uh, to me, it looks like, although you can pick them up for a little bit less, the medium price is close to 80 to 100 bucks. And then up from that, I found, uh, I think it's the International uh, MSR Whisper Light through a Canadian website that I'm not familiar with. They're selling it for 120 uh, and anything over 60 bucks is free shipping. So shipping shouldn't be any more. Uh, throw taxes on that. You're looking at 130 ish. Yeah. Uh, say like 135. You're 135, 140 by the time it's all said and done. And he's 112. It was plus another 16, 17 bucks in taxes on top of that. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at a bit of money. The thing that I kind of like about it. I mean, we said that the, fuel or the compressed canisters the you know the isopropane pain or whatever isobutane those things are relatively cheap but it's still five six bucks a can or more uh similar propane the small tanks of propane are relatively expensive i know some people refill them these have uh, gone up drastically in price uh with uh, the pandemic and stuff like that i've been watching for them to go on sale and i don't know if that'll ever happen again because i've been watching for a long time uh, and they've probably doubled in cut price. I think, uh, Walmart has them for 12 to $14 each. And that yeah. used to be the cost for a two pack. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it wasn't that long ago. I remember buying them for $3 and change. And now like you said, you're buying them for close to, to 10, 12 bucks. So that's, that's a huge increase. Uh, and sadly, like the 20 pound tank doesn't cost that much more to fill. So it to me is, is purely a, a gouge. Um, and I have a friend, he may or may not be here, but he, uh, he fills his own and he said like get, filling them and, and we're not encouraging this by any means because there is risks involved with this, but filling them, you usually don't get them a hundred percent filled. He figured maybe about three quarters full, but still that's better than nutting. Um, and you can fill like, you can fill a 20 to 30 pound tank for 20, 30 ish dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's theoretically you know a 20 pound tank should be able to fill about 40 of these you won't get 40 filled i don't think because as you get down on pressure you'll you'll have trouble filling them yep. but still that's uh you know less than a buck a tank to fill them so if you have a handful of those tanks you save them keep them in good shape and you could fill them theoretically you could fill them for a lot less than the 12 bucks it's expensive uh but the thing with the multi fuel is gas, even at a buck fifty ish, it's less than that now, I know. But like, let's say, predict in the future, it's going to be about buck fifty a liter. That liter is still going to get you a full trip for two bucks. Like, it's still potentially, after you've paid for your stove, one of the cheapest methods of fuel. And like I said, that'll last you almost two hours of burn like over two hours of burn time so that's a lot of cooking when you're thinking that you can boil water in three to five minutes so and another big benefit that i see with it is this would be a stove that i'd be more apt to carry on my atv or something like that right uh, yeah. and i always carry a jerry can on that at least a little bit of spare fuel one fuel cell is going to do two uses on this yeah yeah uh and it's a fuel that's available year round like those isopropane tanks a couple of years ago we bought one of those stoves really kind of liked it it was a little bigger than the light one i have but it worked really well stable uh and we went to four or five stores like canadian tire had none like you could not get them at canadian tire four or five years ago and i eventually found them in a in a home hardware uh but they only had three or four cans so i ended up buying pretty well everything they had and i i mean I feel like somebody else came in a few days behind me and probably needed one and couldn't get one. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, I have found that with that stuff too. And it was only a year or two ago, there was a massive recall on some of those, which caused a shortage. Uh, yeah. The tanks weren't regulated right or something like that. And they were leaking. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But it, it was specifically with that fuel. Now, is that a one-time thing? Most likely, but it still created a massive shortage of them. Yeah. So uh, I do really like the concept and I'm, I'm seriously looking at maybe in the next few months getting one of these multi fuels and really playing around with them. There is risks with them. Yes, they have the, but they're not super heavy. They're still considered a, a reasonably weighted stove. And a lot of them can still take those compressed air tanks. Uh, in addition to the, 
the liquid fuels mm -hmm. uh, and they're still relatively efficient they're, they're very versatile so if you are looking for a one stove kind of does it all that may be the method um, that, that you can use pretty well year round from can burn with whatever fuels available be it kerosene uh, oils like lamp oils and stuff uh, you name it like you can pretty well run through if it's a flammable liquid you can put it in and, and get it to burn for some of these stoves read the manufacturer's instructions obviously but having something that gives you those options means that if you want to get to like a doomsday scenario uh, you would have the most options like almost any fuel source you find you can pretty well run through the stove right I believe there's also adapters for propane tanks if you want to run them up so yep and those multi-fuel ones once again they kind of look like the best bang for buck when you look at all around kind of dealio you know what i mean once again we're not experts we're not saying if you're going to buy one stove go out and buy this one it's just our thoughts at the time um so if you're good ben there was a couple things i want to talk about here at the end because we did kind of go through gave our options because I know we're going to get asked about them or somebody out there is going to be listening and wondering about them. And these are going to be the non-backpacking options in my mind, but people still may have an, a question about them if they're cold weather camping and stuff like that. And that would be like, uh, I call them camp stoves. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to get your like Coleman double burner or single burner with the... Uh, the, the stove fuels, you can get the, uh, I actually got one sitting over there, the straight butane looks like it takes a, a can of lighter fluid that goes into them and they turn on, it's yeah. a real fancy thing there. My propane stove, which I had here, which is just a single burner propane stove, Coleman does the same thing. Now all these stoves um, that we're labeling, or at least I'm labeling as camp stoves, less so than like backpacking stoves, which is what we were talking about. Um, they're going to work in cool weather. Uh, they still suffer the same plagues as their backpacking counterparts. So the Coleman with the camp fuel, uh, Coleman does a lantern like this and a few other things. Real cold weather, it's tricky to get those things going because you have to get that turned to a vapor uh, and that vapor has to ignite. So if it's really cold, you can't get that to vaporize at all. And they work on the system same as the multi-fuel there. The pipe usually will go through uh, a burner or over a burner. Um, yeah. and then it'll heat that pipe and it'll help vaporize it and things like that. But you got to get it started. And that's really where they kind of fall flat with me, uh, especially below minus 10, minus 20 again. They are hard. Uh, and I think I've mentioned I wasn't able to get one going with a lighter. Not not even like the little self-igniters that come with some of these, but uh, an actual lighter holding it on there it would puff a little bit, maybe run for three, four seconds, then go out. And yeah. ultimately it just didn't go so good now propane on the other hand uh it has a little bit more reliability in cold weather but coming from a person that used to run propane in their house when they were younger uh if you get really cold days you could potentially still have some issues with propane uh it has to get pretty cold but uh for us at least this is eastern canada and we we have the the possibility of get, getting really cold so just keep that in mind too and that's going to be down around like your minus 20s minus 30s once again Mileage is going to vary on this. That's my experience. Uh, we used to use uh, old propane stove as our main source of cooking when I was younger. And uh, when things would get really cold, we would have problems with uh, pilot lights potentially flickering and the stove not uh, putting out as much BTUs as it should. And I can remember, you know, like, okay, while well, it's cold tonight, we're going to turn the propane off and we'll go down in the morning once the sun hits it and we'll turn it back on and relight the pilot lights and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it's not that it's as susceptible, but it is susceptible to colder weathers as well. So anything that's a liquid, anything that works on a vapor principle, which is everything because, you know, vapors burn, uh, the colder it is, the harder it's going to be to vaporize. Yeah. So that's where these, once again, these multi-fuel uh, multi stoves come into it because they got such low flash points. And for me, at least, that's where my train of thought is going. The lower the flash point, the lower the relative temperature has to be to get that to vaporize. So, I mean, the science seems sound, if that makes any kind of sense. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have, uh, we use the old Coleman uh, white gas stoves uh, growing up occasionally. And I use them in the military and I've used them, them this year. Um, and you know what? If you don't know what you're doing with them they can those can be quite tricky uh you have to get them to light you have to kind of baby them till they, they warm up enough and then once they get going they're very stable they work really well 
uh, the temptation for a lot of people is to get the flame going and just let it go. And next thing you know, because you were pumping out liquid, once it goes to a gas, the flame completely changes. And next thing you know, you have something that's on fire or you have like literally buildup of liquid uh, fuel inside the burners and they just won't go out and you don't know what's going on because mm -hmm. you, they're, they're a bit of an art to get them to work well and right. But once you get them working, like they're an awesome stove. Uh, the propane one's definitely simpler, easier, quicker. There's no pumping. Uh, and the, the pumping themselves, there's actually winter kits for those stoves and those lanterns, like the, the, the white fuel lanterns. There's a winter kit. It's a different pump because the pump, because everything's cold and stuff, mm -hmm. the pump is just usually a little better, a little thicker, a little. Uh, and you can buy these kits and you need to maintain them. And there's a lot of work to maintaining them and they can carb over and you have to take the burners apart and clean them all up. So a lot to it. That's where I'm at with mine. I have both a lamp and a stove. Yeah. Both need to be pulled apart and cleaned at this point. Yeah. So, uh, you know, eh, there's an enjoyment to it. There's a bit of satisfaction though, because if you can use one, it, it is kind of fun and it's kind of like, I feel like a sense of accomplishment. Like I can do this. I can use this. I'm really happy with it. It's, it does what I want, but just realize that it does take time and experience and it's just not going to come perfect for everyone. The first time you use it, uh, but it's worth, it is worth the learning curve to use those propane quick and simple dirty. But like you said, at one point when it gets cold enough, uh, even propane suffers from those uh, issues. Now the bigger tanks, suffer a little less but they still suffer from it um than the small tanks uh, i think even like nobody has not seen this in the summer if you run those little tiny propane tanks on a hot humid day they'll literally build frost on them yep right so if you're pulling a lot of btus out of one of these things it means it's decompressing gas at a relatively quick rate and and a liquid going to a gas is almost always an endothermic Exothermic reaction. reaction. You're getting rid of heat. This should get cold if you're releasing a vapor. It gets cold. Yeah, it's, it's absorbing the cold. So they cool down. Like If you yes. ever use air, air compressed air tools, pull the trigger, it gets cold. Cold to the touch. Like You can actually like get frost burn off an air tool if you're running it real hard. Those tanks, when they're decompressing, the same thing with uh, paintball guns. And that's what I was just going to say is anybody that used to play paintball with CO2, if you're firing quick, the tank can frost up. You can actually end up shooting liquid CO2 at the end of it. Uh, and you were right. It's endothermic, not exothermic. That's my bad. Yeah. So that endothermic, that, that, that cold, it, it's going to get cold. What it's doing is absorbing the heat to turn that, that liquid into a, a gas. It's, it's using that heat. Well, in the winter, it's already at, say, minus 17, which is the outside temperature, let's say. And then you're pulling stuff out of it. That tank's getting colder than that. So your tank will be minus 24, minus 30 on this relatively cold day. At some point, it's going to hit status and it's going to want to just stay a liquid. And you, nothing you're going to do to it. You can shake it. You can shy of warming the tank back up. And like you said, like sticking it into your jacket. Uh, one of those big propane tanks in your jacket, that's a lot to heat up with body heat. It's going to take time. Now, what we used to do, and I can hear uh, a lot of people rolling their eyes and going to tell me, that's a bad idea. But what we used to do, uh, when we used to like cut wood, logging camps, things like that, or play paintball, throw a sock around the <laughs> container, and you put one of those hand warmers in it. <laughs> now, I'm not advocating this, and I'm not telling anybody to go out and do it, but I am saying that I have done it in the past, good, bad, or otherwise. I've, I've seen worse done, man. I've seen people actually light a small fire next to the tank. Yeah, no, uh, never got quite that brave. But I, I do remember specifically with paintball, we'd like throw a big wool sock over it and break open two or three of those hand warmers and jam down in it. That way we could play a little later in the year. Because yeah. as the temperature dropped, paintball got, well, one, the paintballs would start to freeze and they'd turn brittle and you wouldn't be able to shoot them. Um and two, the, the ball would basically roll out the end of the barrel because there's no room for that gas to change, or sorry, that liquid to change back to a gas and expand and yep. go out. It just kind of goes bleh. 
And you can literally throw these things further than they were shooting. But it's just one of the challenges of winter, though. Like, you know, getting a good stove that works year round is difficult. Um, and I think your your best options probably are solid fuel stoves, be them wood pellets, uh, debris stoves, things like that, the little reburner stoves, stuff like that, or the the Isbeth style stoves that. Uh, I think those are really good methods. And the multi-fuels, uh, but the canister fuel stoves, I think that's where their their downfall really is, is cold weather, because they really shine in the summer. Uh, lightweight, easy to use. Uh, and alcohol stoves, uh, based on their, their low technology, I mean, I, and there are designs out there. I've seen designs where people have the pipes that run around and get into the flame, and uh, they, they're much more complex complex will work really well because they'll self-heat themselves better uh, but if you're just trying to go for the quick simple penny stove uh, they suffer from the same problem and there are things you can do uh, some kind of insulated base to put them on and that could be as little as a piece of wood uh, just because the wood is not going to be as cold as a rock and i mean i've tried that like putting on rock or steel pan just to prevent debris and snow from getting on it Hmm. sucks the heat right out of the alcohol stove uh, and what i ended up doing is wasting a lot of alcohol by pouring in that little pan around that rock to get the thing lit but then as soon as that flame burned out you'd watch the, the stove go out again like it wasn't producing enough heat to keep itself running just looking in the comments here um Terra scout adventures have you guys tried out the kelly kettle um and I think I know what you mean by Kelly Kettle. I don't own one, but I think I've tried a knockoff. It's the kettle that you build a fire in the center of, a kind of deal, right? Yeah. Okay. Try to knock off brand of them. Awesome really? idea. Where'd you find a knockoff brand? I don't never... know. It, 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 I think what it was, and it might have been self made. It looks like an old. Do you know what I mean by an old milk tin? Like the old milk jugs they used to use on the farm? Looks almost yeah. exactly like a Kelly kettle, except it doesn't have the hole in the middle. Well, it was about yeah. that big, and then somebody had ran some pipe through the center off it. So I assumed it was a knockoff brand, but it very well could have been somebody playing with a welder. But in any case, the idea itself uh, seemed intriguing to me. And, I mean, you're spreading out that surface area, so and you could potentially make that into a little rocket stove type of deal. Because I think the Kelly stove itself, if I remember correctly, comes with a base and stuff where you set it up basically like a rocket stove, right? Yeah, no, they're they're awesome, and uh, I've never got to use one. I've looked them up. I've, I've I've really sized them up, and I've looked at them in the stores quite a bit. And I do love the, the concept of them. Um, just see if I can find one, like a good link to set, throw up there. I'm trying to see if I can find one too myself. Like I said, it's been a while since I even thought about one of those. Okay. Yeah, here. I think you can get them on Amazon for 90 bucks, believe it or not. You throwing me a link my way? Well, I'm going back to the Amazon one now. But anyway, uh, so no. My answer would be I haven't actually tried uh, a Kelly stove or a real Kelly stove. I've looked at the concept. I understand the concept. And honestly, to me, if you're going to go with a solid fuel stove for uh, like cooking and things like that, this, this kind of seems to be a good one. My only question for would be, could you cook on top of that? Well, it's boiling your water. And this is where I don't know enough about them. You know what I mean? I lost that link. Damn it. Here, I can pull up Kelly stove so people know what oh, I, I got one here. And I think it's one of, it's it's actually a knockoff. That's yeah, the Kelly stove is a bit more expensive. And rightfully so. It's a it is a good stove. It has a great reputation. Uh, but here's the Kelly the, Kettle, here's, actually. Yeah, Kelly Kettle. Yeah. This is the Gilly aluminum camping kettle same idea though so i just sent you so here's the one ben was talking about there this is uh what you call this one the gilly aluminum gilly camp camping kettles and same kind of dealio now like i said my question to these would be can you cook on top of them or by putting that on there is it gonna basically suffocate your your fire out. I'd be I'd be curious to hear from somebody that owns one on that. I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send you another one. This this is pretty neat. 
And so this is a whole cook system made by that. And in depth, it looks like, yeah, you can put a grill over it. And they even show a picture of it. Yeah. Fire base, double wall chamber. Fire goes up through the center. Uh, but there's a grill that can go on. And there's actually a little bowl that can go over the top of it. So you could be cooking on top of it while boiling water. Yeah, see, that, that makes it more interesting to me. My but, thought was always the limitation was all it could do was boil water. And I but, said, no, no, no. The way this is designed, somebody had to have thought of how to make this incorporate into a stove. But look at the overall price here. The last picture kind of shows you the ideal aspect of it. So there. So you see they got a little cross piece and then a bowl can go over the top. So you're definitely maximizing the BTUs out of that fire. Like you light a fire in the base. It's heating at the base of that kettle coming all the way up the chimney. You're getting a lot of efficiency there. And then what's exhausting at the top can cook out of that bowl. So, like, maximizing. And then you take the whole kettle off, and you've got a grill that you can put on there. Um, yeah, I think it's a great, great option. It's just, you know, awesome option. It is a bit much money from what I want to do. And the downside to it kind of is the same with the other wood ones. It's wet weather here a lot of the year. And you're feeding through a small port. So you have to process your wood pretty pretty fine. The wood pellets would work really good here too. That was my thought with one of these. And honestly, I love the idea of this Kelly kettle. And I know we kind of get off topic, but not really. My only concern would once again be dry materials and depending where you're going to go. Because these look a little taller depending on the size you get too. So you're tube firing it. Instead of having a small wider fire, which is what I personally like just because... I don't know why. It's just personally what I like better. Uh, you're kind of getting a long, taller fire. But yeah. that might work to your advantage. Like I said, if you could set this up in a rocket stove configuration, you could really effectively use a lot of heat with a very moderate amount of fuel. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I think the Kelly kettle is a, is a great mm -hmm. option, uh, especially if you have one or you can pick one up, especially used. Uh, I think I have seen them in flea markets and stuff, and, I, and honestly, not for that much. Um, so keep your eye open for these things. Uh, it's great, and I wouldn't call it a gimmick, although I'm, I kind of want to a little bit. It does kind of limit your things. You're not going to be cooking food inside the kettle. Hmm. So just because it'll be more difficult to clean the kettle itself. So you want to put clean water in that. This is my opinion. Uh, it just if you put like noodles in there and boiled them, how would you ever know you got them all out? So now you have a noodle stuck in there. It's going to be in there forever. That's extra protein. Or carbs, I guess, in this case. Also, the ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people who eat these things. <laughs> yeah, I can't talk. I might have... Well, no, I made my own Mr. Noodles. I don't... I rarely eat the store-bought ones. I kind of make my own. I just, it, but it's no better for me. I can guarantee you that. I, I've just never liked the idea of Mr. Noodles. And, I mean, this this is a topic of conversation. We've had it before. Where, you know, it seems to be the the bushcraft food for a lot of people. Oh yeah. I'm going in the woods and I'm taking just nothing but Mr. Noodles for, for a week. And, uh, you and I both know that will never happen with Mr. Greening. Mr. Greening will never be caught in the woods with Mr. <laughs> Noodles as a sole source of food or even as a potential source of food. <laughs> I will eat a lot of food before I do that. Right. But that's just me i mean it, it works great for a lot of people and i think that's awesome if you enjoy mr news i'm not taking that away from you it's just not my solution um but uh yeah uh you know there are a lot of methods out there to cook food in the winter i'm not saying there isn't i'm just do be aware of the downsides of the different types of fuels and stuff and really take that into account where you're going uh like we said like if you're going to a say a national park let's say keji they don't want you cutting any wood they don't want you picking up debris from around the area and burning. So they're not going to be overly ideal uh, with with a, a pellet stove or a, not a pellet stove, uh, like a, uh, a, a twig stove. stove. Twig stove. Um, do I see this as really a problem? Do I see, think picking up a few pieces of birch and a few dry branches off the ground is really hurting the environment? Absolutely not. I do not think that that's ever going to be a problem. But just be aware of your potential uh, issue because all you need to do is find somebody who's a little bit more, who takes things too literally, in my opinion, 
And next thing you know, you have somebody complaining about you or you got a warden coming in and, and nobody likes conflict. We're out there to relax and enjoy ourselves. So if you can avoid that. And do. I mean, it's their park, their rules. That's what it comes down to. You know what I mean? You don't have yeah. to agree with them. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you don't have to agree with them, but you do kind of have to follow them if you don't want to be ha harassed and, and, and bothered. So that's just kind of my thought process with this thing. So those are the options really that we came up with. Uh, and the, the Kelly kettle definitely falls into and the, that Gilly stove. So yes, there is knockoff brands, which is neat. I didn't know there was, um, uh, into, uh, you know, uh, a twig stove. It's, 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 that's what it essentially is. It's a twig stove, a twig stove that's been refined a little bit. Uh, and I think they're probably extremely efficient. Uh, and we've covered twig stoves before. Yep. No sense beating the dead horse on that one. And I think you can use alcohol and other fuels in those. Just be careful with it. Just pour a bit in the base, light it off. I'm sure it'll work. Pause it will work, actually. But yeah, I think that kind of covers our topic for tonight. Uh, Any more, and we'll probably be going on one of our long rants, which we are known for. But no. in the spirit of keeping it organized, let's try and, uh, I guess, round it off there. Uh, so as Ben said, yeah, that's our two cents on the subject. We are not subject matter experts um, by any stretch of the imagination. We have a little bit of experience with it. We have our opinions. This is uh, our thoughts on it. And we open um, the floor to you folks out there. Do you have different thoughts? Is there something we missed? Uh, definitely get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. Facebook page, email, whatever the case may be. Uh, last thing I'd like to send off here is for everybody out there, hope you had a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, uh, whatever, you know, is you and yours. And I hope everybody out there has a good New Year's because that's coming up at the end of this week. It is. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and Steve's poking fun at you. He said, nice holiday, half beard. <laughs> I haven't had to be at work for days and no real need to shave. And I'm back with everything going on. I don't even feel like going out and seeing people. So I'm just staying here and doing my thing. I did get out for some hikes recently. Uh, I hope everyone's getting out and doing stuff. Like it is beautiful here this time of year. Um, but uh, yeah, there's still tons to get out, but nothing beats a good little boil up in the woods. And this right topic back. tonight really plays with that is getting out there and having that little cook up and do doing stuff um so it's a lot of fun and like robert said uh sort of you know happy holidays merry christmas happy new year all that sort of thing uh from both of us for sure uh from my family and i'm sure robert's oh i gotta stop talking bad about him he's back no continue i love to hear the bad things about me <laughs> <clears throat> Um, but, uh, yeah, get out there, have some fun, enjoy it. Uh, take this, this advice, get out there with your kit and test it out and let us know what you found and what you enjoyed and what you think works best for you. I'd love to see, you know, why you choose the things you do, because, uh, I think me and Robert both suffer from this. We like to overanalyze a lot of stuff and we like to really look at it and compare things. And I will spend hours and I, I'm, I see Robert laughing because I overanalyze or obsessing. Obsessing. Well, we've, we've definitely been accused of this by by many people, and I'm sure both of our wives, <laughs> uh, and other people's wives, strangely enough, have accused of me of this. Uh, but I do. I like to look at things and then look at all the pro pros and cons. And if there's ever like a piece of equipment that you want overanalyzed, just send it to me and say, "What do you think?" And I'm going to tell you. And, we'll pick uh, it apart. We are brutally honest. Uh, good and bad, don't get me wrong. We are not loyal to anything, but we we do pick stuff apart. And don't... That doesn't mean we're going to say it's bad. That just means we open up your imagination to the negatives to make an ass valid assessment. Uh, yeah, I, I, I sometimes feel bad because uh, somebody will bring up something and I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh, this is awesome because of this, this, and this. But did you think about this, this, and this? And I feel bad then later. I'm like, oh, did I just tell someone that they're saying it's shit? And it's like, no, that's not what I did. No, I don't think I it's that. Well, ho hopefully it's never taken that way. And honestly, but, anything we ever talk about on here, hopefully it never comes across as that way. Yeah. Like I said, we do analyze things to a depth most people give up on. 
about six days prior to us. <laughs> and Sometime you're sooner. <laughs> so, man, you're generous. Six. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will look at things for months sometimes before I'll purchase them. And there's things that I've researched for years and still have been purchased. And I've like obsessed and I really want it. But I'm like, oh, that much money. And does it really give me all the gains or can I just do make do? And a lot of times I will. Or, or here's the fun one. And I know we both do it. Can I make it for that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I'm usually at. I wonder if I can make something comparable for less money that'll work just as well, and I can put my own flair on it because I can make it solve some other issue that I may be having. Yeah. And then the final question is, did it actually work? And that one usually comes up being a little trickier. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And if there's anyone that ever wants to get a piece of equipment and just says, I really want to test it, just send it to us. We will put it through every pace possible. Uh, you may not get an answer as quick as you'd like, but we're going to tell no, you. No, we are a little slower, but we're working on that. And there may be news in the new year uh, after Ben and I chat a little bit, but we'll see how things go. And there was one last thing that I wanted to end on this, Ben, if that's all right. It's of a personal oh, yeah. nature. I wanted to say thank you once again for Missy G Makes and Ben there. They did provide me with a Christmas present that I think was pretty nice. So that's the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures Foldable Cap Edition. Uh, and I have to say... I really enjoyed this. I've been wearing it for the last couple days. Uh, much better hat than I thought it was going to be when you first told me about these folding hats oh so long ago. And yes. then only to get one, and Ben did give me another present that poked a little fun at me. We'll talk about that some other time. But <laughs> uh, the hat, amazing hat. And once again, thank you very much. Uh, Ben's wife, Missy G, she does this. She has a Facebook page. Please, if you're interested in stuff like this done, you're uh, in the local area or are willing to chat over email about getting a shipped or something like that, check out our Facebook page. Uh, it's Missy G Makes, correct, Ben? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and just so you know, a friend will send you a gift that's really sweet and nice, but only a really good friend will send you one that just sort of tweaks you a bit. <laughs> I mean, it, it was in good fun, and now the game is on, friend. Well, okay. We're going to have to see what I can do to one-up that now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a game. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> I know. This will be fun. This may be its own series. But anyway, that's it for me for tonight anyway. N never start a prank war with me. You'll always lose. I guarantee yeah. you. <laughs> it's all in good fun. There are no losers in prank wars. Yeah. But uh, no. I hope you enjoy it. Night, everybody. Get out there. Have fun. Let us know about it. <laughs>